Boeing whistleblower Sam Salapour told Congress Wednesday that he was physically threatened after he spoke out in a meeting and told colleagues that he had serious safety concerns about Boeing aircraft. Salapour revealed he received physical threats at the company when he raised these concerns. I was <laughs> sidelined. I was told to shut up. I received physical threats. My, 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 my boss said, I would have killed someone who said what you said in a meeting. And then this is not a safety culture when you get threatened by bringing issues of safety concerns. Another whistleblower at the hearing, former senior manager at Boeing, Ed Pearson, said Boeing continues to hide the truth. Unless action is taken and leaders are held accountable, every person stepping aboard a Boeing airplane is at risk. Government authorities ignored Boeing's manufacturing problems until the Alaska accident. Passengers shouldn't have to rely on whistleblowers to provide the truth. Is the gold standard is now fool's gold. Because the only thing that is more dangerous than a dangerous environment is the illusion of a safe environment. The company illegally removed thousands of quality control inspections on individual airplanes without the FAA's knowledge and without the knowledge of the airlines. Although many of these inspections have been reinstated, hundreds of airplanes have left Boeing factories without those thousands of inspections. I'm not going to sugarcoat this. This is a criminal cover-up. Joining us now to discuss is Senior Fellow for Aviation and Travel at the American Economic Liberties Project, who worked in the airline ground operation and was licensed as an, airline, uh, an aircraft dispatcher by the Federal Aviation Administration in 1990 and was appointed to the Future of Aviation Advisory Committee in 2010. William McGee, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate your, it. Your credentials and knowledge base here are certainly not in question. So let us know, how do we get to a place where so much of these oversight regulations that had been in place were stripped away, allowing for potential disasters like the door blowing off in that Alaska airline flight to happen in the first place? Well, it's been a long and steady degradation. There's no two ways about it. Uh, what we have in this country is that for the last 40 plus years, dating back to the Reagan administration, so we're talking seven presidential administrations, Democrats and Republicans, uh, we have underfunded and understaffed the FAA. And the FAA basically does what it can with what it has, but it is not nearly enough. Think about how much the FAA has to do. They have to oversee every airplane, every airport, every airline, every manufacturer, and every licensed person in the United States. That is a huge job. And so because of this underfunding and understaffing, they have gone to plan B. They simply don't have the resources. So what they have done is they've created programs like I just recently wrote about, uh, something called ODA, which is the Organization Designation Authority. And what that is, is you're a Boeing employee, you're a mid-level employee, you work at Boeing, Boeing pays your, your paycheck, and yet you're also doing dual duty as an FAA inspector. So if you're on the line and you see a problem with an airplane, you're the one that has to go to your boss at Boeing and say, we need to shut this down. And in the aircraft manufacturing business, millions quickly become billions. So what you have is, you know, you might be shutting down assembly, delaying delay, you know, delivery of aircraft. And so this is an untenable situation. Imagine being that person, you, you know, your, your mortgage or your rent or your kid's education is being paid for by Boeing. And you have to tell the CEO of Boeing that there's a problem. It doesn't work. It's untenable. We need to have the FAA have the resources and the training and the staff to do their job, which is to provide oversight. This, for some of us, nothing that has happened lately is a surprise. I know a lot of people are surprised by what they're hearing and they're kind of shocked. I wrote a book 12 years ago called Attention All Passengers, talking about the FAA and the nickname that it has in the uh, aviation industry, and that is uh, the Tombstone Agency, which means that um, it's far too often problems are known, but nothing is done until there's a fatality or some sort of serious event. So this is a long time in coming. And I believe right now we're sort of at a crossroads. Are we going to live up to what we say? We say publicly that we want the safest system in the world, which we currently have, but it is definitely under fire. And we say that we have zero tolerance for accidents and fatalities. Well, are we gonna put up the money? And no, no question, we're, we're studying this at AELP. It is gonna be a lot of money to do what we're talking about here. But the alternative is worse. 
Uh, it's, it's Boeing failing, for one thing. It's the airlines failing, for another. But most important is the human cost. Uh, we're going to have to decide, with all of the money that we put in the federal budget, are we going to increase the FAA's budget? Not just throw money at a problem, but to actually hire the people that we need to hire. And that's, I don't know the answer to that question, but I, I hope that there are folks listening to this. We've had you on before to discuss this, so my my question or my framing will probably be familiar to you. But for viewers who might be, you know, tuning in and didn't see the last time we discussed, you know, help help me overcome my my skepticism on a couple fronts, being that we've not had uh, a plane crashes in the U.S. We've had a very few number of fatalities relating to um, problems with the airplanes in the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years. Um, it's not like compared to other forms of transportation, it's extremely, exceedingly, unbelievably safe. What has happened with uh, with air travel over the course of my lifetime, it's gotten in much more um, difficult, time consuming, safety oriented because of TSA issues for a kind of theater that I think the vast majority of people and experts think is largely pointless. And it's gotten more expensive and more time consuming. And my fear is in empowering more regulators to do more investigations, more checks, more oversight, you would um, exacerbate the costs and the time-consuming nature. Now, maybe you would do that in order to improve safety, and you know we should have a public uh, conversation as a, as a people, as voters, about whether we want more costs and, and more time consuming, but a lot more safety. But given that we, it, it, it remains extremely safe up till now, um, is that something the American people would really be interested in? Well, I think we should start by asking the folks that were on board that Alaska Airlines flight over Portland. Um, do they think it's worth the investment? Um, the fact is that you're correct in that statistically, the safety record has never been better. But when I speak to safety experts, and I interviewed dozens and dozens of them when I was working on my book, for example, um, the fact is they will tell you that the, the safety record itself, while it's obviously critical and important, it is not the only measure. There's something called the safety net, and that means are we doing enough to prevent events in the future? And when we, when we get complacent and just look at the, you know, the accident record and say, well, there haven't been many fatalities, so we must be doing something right. I think that's false, quite frankly. Um, the fact is we could be doing things wrong. And, and these are warning signals. If what happened with that door plug blowing out, it's miraculous that no one was seriously injured or killed. And if there had been a, a lap child, an infant sitting in that row, we never would have seen them again. Um, we, when we get these warnings, if we choose to ignore them, and if we just choose to focus on cost, then I guess we're going to have to live with those consequences. Now, I am saying that we as a nation, the FAA is on record, Congress is on record, president after president is on record. We want the safest system in the world. Well, that costs money. It's that simple. And for all the things that the airlines nickel and dime us on, uh, safety should not be one of them. Uh, the fact is that as taxpayers, we are going to have to bolster the FAA to do its job. Self-policing has failed. There's no argument about it, in my view. I don't think anyone can say that Boeing is exhibit A in this, that self-policing works. It doesn't. You've uh, argued that the FAA is being underfunded and that they need the funding to hire the right people to conduct the safety evaluations. They'll actually keep people safe in flight. Another argument that's emerged uh, as to, uh, to explain why all this is happening is DEI focus. People have pointed out that seeing an occasional black pilot is evidence that they are hiring people for all the wrong reasons, uh, de facto evidence, presumably, that if you see a black pilot, they were not hired because they were the best person for the job. Can you speak to whether or not DEI is to blame for these accidents we've seen recently? I have to be honest, it's hard for me to talk about this without getting a little angry, because I think it is one of the most bogus arguments ever of all of the problems at Boeing. And they are documented time and again. We've heard from these whistleblowers. We just had a whistleblower die under very suspicious circumstances recently at Boeing. For all of the problems at Boeing, which have been documented time and again, right now we have three federal investigations, the FAA, the National Transportation Safety Board, and shockingly, the Department of Justice, which is which is investigating Boeing as a criminal issue, 
and the FBI just sent out letters to everybody on board that Alaska Airlines flight saying they might be part of a criminal investigation. With all of that going on, to pin this on DEI is absurd, it's racist, it's misogynist, and it's just complete bullshit. I'm sorry, I don't know how else to say it. Um, and this is not new in this industry. The fact is that if you look at the cockpits in US airlines, um, they do not even come close to reflecting the American population in terms of people of color, in terms of women. Now, I know about DEI. I teach at Vaughan College of Aeronautics. I teach future pilots, air traffic controllers, dispatchers. And Vaughan has one of the most diverse student bodies in the country. The fact is, DEI is about opening doors and providing opportunities so people get the same chance. But let's be so crystal clear about this and put it in all caps. It does not mean lowering standards. It just means offering opportunities to those who haven't traditionally gotten them. But nobody is getting a different test score or, or, or you know, being waived from any requirements. So when this whisper campaign of DEI is the problem at Boeing, we've seen things like this before. After the two fatal MAX accidents in 2018 and 2019 in Indonesia and in uh, Ethiopia, I was talking to people in the industry who were saying to me, well, off the record, Bill, you know, these are third world pilots, Ethiopia, you know. Uh, that is absolute BS. The fact is it was Boeing's responsibility and Boeing was at fault for not telling those airlines all around the world, all their customers about that new MCAS system that they implemented and those pilots were not familiar with it and they weren't trained properly on it. And so uh, of all of the things that need to be fixed at Boeing, and it's a long list, DEI is not one of them. Hmm. William McGee, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I appreciate it.